Welcome to the latest edition of Indy Stars Dog Talk Podcast. I am Matt Glenesk, joined by Indy Stars Butler Insider, Akeem Glasby. Akeem, how are we doing? Good, good. Yeah, we got uh, some basketball to talk about now. We're three games in, somehow. Seems like uh, we were just covering preseason uh, a little bit ago, but now we're in the swing of things, and uh, yeah, we got a lot going on. All right, so we had a game on Monday night. Butler beats Western Michigan um, by 20-ish. No, by 20? Yeah, exactly yes. 20, yep. Sure, there you go. I'm good at math. Um, not Didn't look so great in the first half. Close game. They pulled away in the second half. Obviously, this is on the heels of that Austin P loss, um, which wasn't good. So I want to start there. I'm going to start with the bad, and then we'll work into the good, um, just because that's how I'm wired. So what <laughs> happened again? What happened against Austin P? Why did Butler lose that game? Yeah, turnovers. Turnovers killed them. The the offense was out of sync, and it just it started literally from the opening tip. They had a just a shot clock, shot clock violation on the first possession. It, that's just it's just kind of shows that the team was not expecting the pressure they got from Austin P just were a little unprepared. And Coach Mata said the same after the game. He said, you know, those the pressure that Austin P played with, you know, their tendencies, that was covered in the scout. That was covered in the, you know, the walkthrough in practice. But they, they just were not prepared for it. And they struggled with turnovers. Um, I believe they had 16 turnovers as a team and it's just out of sync and they started to show signs of in the second half of, of fight and that kind of what led to the changes that happened against Western Michigan on on, on uh, Monday but yeah just a very poor performance uh, and it seems like they had some you know kind of a, a come to Jesus moment uh, some uh, in, so to say and uh, they really wanted to fix the mistakes that they had and they showed definite improvement against Western Michigan I mean it's it's hard to, to glean too much for it because of the level of competition that's a game that Butler should have won but uh, after the Austin P game there were a lot of questions that needed to be answered and it seems like they're kind of heading toward the right way uh, and the point guard was one position that needed to be filled and it seems like Finley Bizjak he he didn't play uh, against Austin P but he um, I'm sorry. He, Against uh, Missouri State, he didn't play. Yes, Missouri State. Sorry. Yep. And they struggled with uh, turnovers there. But uh, Finley Bizjak is kind of solidifying that position a little bit. Not a natural point guard, but he can. She's shown that he can uh, run the offense uh, through two starts, eleven assists, and just one turnover, which which is huge because again they've been really struggling to hold on to the basketball. So. Uh, yeah, the Austin P loss led to, you know, Augusto Cassia moving into the starting lineup, and he's definitely been the spark that this team's needed. Do we have to reset expectations after that Austin P loss, um, or did we reset expectations after the closer-than-expected win over Missouri State where we saw the warts of this team, which is they don't have a point guard? I mean, I we don't – we, yes, we can reset the expectations, but it is still early. I think it's too soon to be too alarmist. You know, these guys are still trying to figure themselves out. You know, people are adjusting to new roles and, you know, new positions. Like I said, Finley, he was he, he was an off-the-bench scorer last year. I mean, he has playmaking ability, but he's bringing – he's taking on a, a whole new role. You know, Jamil seems to be playing at – not Jamil Telfort seems to be playing at less than 100%. And, the, he shoulders a huge load for that team. You, you know, he need they needed 29 points for him for them to beat uh, Missouri State. And you know, if he has nine points or single digit points, it's going to be hard for Butler to, you know, score. But then you, you see a Patrick McCaffrey stepping up, or you see a Pierre Brooks, who he he was kind of the he had maybe the most poor performances in the first two games. And then if he you know goes off for 20 points, they look like a completely different team. They win by 20. So. Yes, I don't. Maybe the preseason ranking was more in line with their, you know, actual production than I anticipated. But I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I, I don't think the sky is falling. And I think, you know, that I think the coach realized, coaching staff realized something needed to change. And for Thad Mata to make an adjustment in the starting lineups three games in, I think he realized how dire that is because he's a very continuity, consistency oriented guy. They started the same starting lineup, you know, 32 of 33 games last year. And to make a change three games in, I think he realized that something needed to, to something needed to happen and they needed the spark. And Augusta Cassia absolutely gave him that spark. And it's what we have talked about on this podcast before. You've talked about Cassia's unique skill set and athleticism and what he can bring to this lineup. Um, you know, I talked about it last year when you saw like the Creighton game. He didn't play a lot, but when he did play, he could defend. 
Now, he might foul some, but he can defend. He can match up with Big East bodies, Big East athletes. And you've always said he can be a rim runner. He can be a rim protector. And those are two things that Andre Screen really isn't. He's not a rim runner. He's not a rim protector. He's a, he's a solid big man if you're running half-court offense through him. But sometimes he's going to get pushed around a little bit. And it just seemed like Cassie's energy and ability to do so many other things really opened up um, this offense for them. And, again, on defense and, and rebounding, too. I mean, this is a guy who's going after every loose, loose ball, and that's what they needed. Yeah, and um, Coach Maurice Joseph spoke after the game. Uh, Coach Mata is under the weather, so he was not available after the game. But Mojo made a lot of good points about, you know, what Augusto brings to the team. And first off, he started by saying that, you know, moving Andre to the bench wasn't a technical demotion. You know, they, they weren't punishing Andre for his play or, you know, trying to prove a point. They wanted to reward Augusto for his play. And, again, the energy that he showed against Austin P and just – the, the way that he plays the game. And they said, you know, energy is contagious. So why not make it positive energy? And they feed off of Augusto, you know, against uh, Western Michigan yesterday. His first play was a breakaway dunk and he's flexing to the student section. You know, he's he's hyped. He gets hyped and he leaves it all out on the court. And that's something that this team needs. They need someone who cares. And both Thad Mata and Maurice Joseph said, they use the phrase, he cares, that, you know, he's passionate. And that kind of shows, and that's something we learned based on the story that I uh, had last night or this morning that, you know, he, he committed to, you know, reshaping his body and getting stronger. He, he chose not to go home. He, he stayed here and, and lifted weights and worked out and he wants to be a better player and he's committed to that. And they, Butler frankly needs more people like that. They need someone who's going to give 110 and play like his hair is on fire every day. And that's, that's what Augusto brings, you know, uh, just the the energy and he's growing as a player you know he's talking about yeah they couldn't they couldn't stop my flash cuts to the rim and he's he's he has two-handed dunks and lobs and then they're building off that when they do cover the cut then they swing to the rotation they, they swing it uh to the wing and get an open three from patrick mccaffrey so they're building and they seem to be putting more on his plate every game and yeah the, the potential is so high for augusto yeah and his path you wrote about this as you say there's a story right now on indystar.com for subscribers on Cassia's path, basically, from Brazil. He's 5,000 miles from home. Mm. He's played at the NBA academies in Mexico, the NBA academies in Australia. Like, he has – I don't. I think he wrote – he hasn't didn't start playing basketball until he was 13. 12, 13 or yeah. maybe – yeah. So, I mean, he's relatively new. Yes, he's an older sophomore. Um, but in terms of basketball experience, not – you know, not still learning the, the intricacies of the game and has a lot of the times been relying on the just supreme athleticism and the physical gifts he has. But now you can see – they you know, last year he got hurt before the season started. So that set him behind the eight ball. And, you know, you don't you can't really throw him to the to the Wolves in Big East play. You know, if, if you didn't get to play against the non-conference schedule, especially when you're new to college basketball and you've only played, you know, some limited things. So you can see. And like you said, he didn't go home. He didn't go to Brazil. He stayed away from his family. He says he, he sees his family maybe once a year. I mean, that just shows this. And he says, I make sacrifices. Basketball is my life. It's what I want to do. And you can see that. And that's. That is, I, I mean, I think he's the key to their season. I think he's mm -hmm. absolutely the key to their season because you know you got what you're going to get with Jamil Telford. You know what you're going to get from Pierre Brooks. And your point guard is still an issue, but if you can get a defensive presence in the paint and also someone who's going to get you 11 points, you know, just here or there, like where you don't actually have to run a play for him, he's just going to get putbacks or things like that. He is the key to their season, I think. Yeah, I mean, we. I'm, I'm going to toot my own horn. I mean, I've said Augusto was the X factor, and he seems to be. I mean, I wasn't sure exactly how much they would put on his plate. I mean, he he was literally used as a defensive specialist last year. He he'd come in for like a possession at the end of the half, and he would make it. He he left his mark, you know, uh, in that way. He had a, a game ceiling block against Providence last year. So yes, the, the, his length could have, his, been a, could have been a foul though. Could have been a foul. Anyway, <laughs> his yeah. length, I mean, just you, when you see him extend in his reach and he's like, I'm in the gaps, I can switch. Like he, his, he's just, he impacts the game in so many ways. And like on the first possession of the game against Western Michigan, he finds himself rotated on the point guard. Like he went from center to point guard. And so he can, 
a lot of people say they can guard one through five, but he really can guard one through five, and that's just so rare. And it's it's great to see him, you know, getting rewarded with a starting spot. And you know, it, it, he seems to really take that to heart, and I think it means a lot to him. And I will say uh, that Finley Bizjak is kind of the other the X factor. Um, uh, I know. I guess you can't have two X factors, but he's going to be another, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's going to be another key. I mean, twenty five minutes, four of six from the field. Nine rebounds, which is, is again, if you're going to take Andre Screen out of the game, your guards are going to have to rebound more. So nine rebounds from Finley Bizjak yesterday, five assists, no turnovers, 10 points. I mean, that sounds like a Big East point guard to me. You know, so in I, I want to – Finley plays in a unique way. There's, there's one thing he does all the time that is so interesting that I, I want to write about. I'm not going to say it here, but he's – He's Ooh, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, uh, but he's he's a he could. I mean, he's he's six three, six four. He's not the, the 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 best athlete, but he has a feel for the game. And if he can grow into a Big East point guard, then again, the doom and gloom and kind of the as poor as they look the first two games, that could be turned around with his solid play. So, and I, I kind of wrote this in uh, again the insider that you know this sophomore class is is looking to be solid contributors. I mean, it, again, it, uh, Mojo said that you know between. Uh, Andre Screen, Bowden Kepke, and Augusto Cassia, they have three different centers with three different skill sets who, you know, are, are interchangeable and you know, based on the, the competition. So you might see, a, you know, a breakout game from Bowden down the line. You, they're obviously not done with Andre, and then Augusto continues to grow. So between Finley and uh, Bowden, you know, and Augusto, those are building blocks with, you know, the the big the big guns coming down the pipe in the, you know, the loaded 2025 recruiting class. So I don't think this guy's falling. You know, I, I think they can head in the right direction. And, you know, as long as they continue to build off yesterday's performance. Were you surprised at how little Capke played on Monday night? No, again, because Western Michigan was a smaller team. So you, Augusto was just having such an impact why, you know, why kind of mess with those minutes? I, I would say Bowden is kind of competing with Andre for minutes now, and Andre has seniority. Obviously, they had they, someone they had big plans for, and they say they still do. So I think you'll see, you know, if they need a pick and pop big, they'll go. You'll see more Bowden, you know, more of an interior big. I mean, I'm sorry, more of a perimeter big. You'll see more Bowden. If they want to bang on the inside and kind of exploit their height uh, advantage that they have, you'll see more Andre. Okay, sounds great. If uh, three games for the season. I would have told you that with Jamal Telford back, with Pierre Brooks back, that Patrick McCaffrey would lead this team in scoring. Mm. What would you have said? I'd say they must be three and zero because you know they, they they'd have three guys <laughs> averaging like fifteen points a game. Uh, so I'd say they're they're they must be doing well. But you know Jamil had twenty nine points, but then I believe he had nine points in each of the yeah, last two that, games. Yeah. So that's. <clears throat> They needed a third score. Uh, DJ Davis took a lot of offense with him to Washington, and Patrick has become a you know their one of their best three point shooters. You know, spotting up, and he has his he has he has another nifty kind of he loves to get in the lane, and then that that turnaround fadeaway is, is uh, that's his kind of go to move. So that's good to see, and he seems to be kind of finding his groove. And uh, Mojo kind of uh, credited him for coaching on defense. That the three quarter pressure that they were using last night against Western Michigan is something he ran a lot at Iowa. So he's kind of helping them settle in in that way. And he's kind of, I know it's cliche that the coach on the court, you know, considering his background is he's literally the coach's son and all that, but he has also, and he's also in his sixth year in college. Like there's nothing he hasn't seen. Exactly. And so he is kind of adding that experience and veteran veteran presence that you would expect. So again, I, I think the pieces are there for a solid season, maybe not, you know, top third of the big East, but they, they could, rightfully settle, you know, in, in the mid of the Big East if they continue to get strides from, you know, the, the key players. All right. Well, big game Friday night. They welcome SMU to town. SMU is 3-0. and They're actually an ACC team. Um, did, who knew that SMU was in the Atlantic Coast Conference? Um, but they are. Uh, they haven't really played anyone yet. I think they've got wins over like UNC Greensboro, some other really small schools. So we don't really know a lot about SMU. How do you how important is this game, especially with what happened against Dawson P? You can't lose another home non-conference game, correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned this in the preseason. Like, these are the resume building wins that they need to get because they're probably not going to be, you know, an automatic bid team. That, or, they, or the, yeah, they will be, but they'll be on the bubble if they want to make it in. They're not going to be, you know, a top five seed. So these are the wins that they need to get 
that will look good, you know, as the season progresses. Uh, it's at home, so that takes a little bit of luster. You know, beating an SMU on the road would really be a statement. But this is a game that they need to win. At the very least, they need to be competitive. They need to – they can't lose in an ugly fashion, but they need to show strides and they, they need to put a strong performance together at home, you know, against a quality performance. Uh, former Butler guard Chuck Harris returning to uh, Hinkle Fieldhouse. So uh, this is an important game, and a win here would look great in terms of a resume-building win that they can look back to, you know, as the season goes on that – you know, this is a game that stands out and this is a tough opponent that we beat, you know, so that's something they need to do. And then, again, they need to continue to build off the performance from yesterday. All right. So we're three games in. We, we like Augusta Cassia as a starter. We think, we think X factor. We like Finley Bizjack as a point guard. We think he's can grow into that role. Is, is, do you th- is that question answered for you at point guard? Or are we still, not ready to say that that's going to be a successful experiment. Yeah, I can't say it's answered until he goes up against Big East competition or even an SMU, like you know, a, a power four, you know, team. Until I see that, I can't say like no. If Finley goes off for twenty and ten against SMU, I'd say okay, they got a, they have a point guard that is resolved. But until I see you know how he can handle the pressure against you know superior athletes, superior talent, experienced players, I'll say it's still a question mark. But he he's shown all the signs again. Eleven assists to one turnover. You can't really ask for much more from your point guard. So the signs are there, the potential is there, but it's still too early to say that it's a definite, you know, check off the, the box uh, answered question for them. Any concerns about the, the guard depth, uh, Colby King and um, who's the other point? Who's the other guy? Land, Landon Land- Moore. Really? Yeah. Really haven't hit the ground running this season. Um, Landon Moore just, I'm mean, even in, against Western Michigan, just kind of seemed to get pushed around a lot. Uh, so, I mean, if, if Finley's starting, you don't have a lot of depth behind them at, in guards. So how concerning is that? Um, uh, it's, it's tough to say because again, you'll see Jamil at, at, with the ball in his hand a lot. You'll see, you know, Patrick McCaffrey initiating the offense. They have a lot of players who can quote unquote play point guard. So in terms of, you know, a guard rotation, I think they'll be okay. Landon has been a little bit disappointing. He, he struggles to hold onto the ball. He, he can kind of get muscled around. He seems very tentative. He seems like a player who's playing with a lack of confidence. So they need a, you know, to boost his which confidence. Is, which is weird because last year he seemed to be very confident. You know, he would come in and, and put up shots the moment he got on the floor. So it just seems like, I mean, especially watching the second half of that Western Michigan game, it just seemed like he was, I'm, I'm not going to say like a problem, but he was just one where they weren't getting bang for their buck out of. Yeah, he, he, he needs a kind of, refine what he can do well and just become more confident in his role. But I will say Colby King looked good. I mean, uh, coach said they want coach Mata said they wanted to play with more tempo. And when Colby got the ball, you know, in transition, he seemed to really t- attack the basket and that's an element they haven't had. I, I called him a one man fast break yesterday. So that's, I, I like that, you know, maybe again, maybe not necessarily a half court traditional floor general, but he's a blur in transition and he can give them some transition points and anything they can do to get easy baskets is good because at times our offense has been, you know, kind of a slog and have been struggling to, to generate anything. So that, you know, he, he could, if he, again, if he can master his role, that's, that'll be a positive for Butler moving forward. Well, you got to get Alex Barlow, that mad scientist in the lab again, start cooking up some offense. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so uh, 3-0 SMU comes to Hinkle Fieldhouse Friday night. Uh, go to the game if you want to. If not, be sure to follow. And even if you are at the game, be sure to follow Akeem for all the updates. He'll have full coverage at IndyStar.com, as he will all season long. And we will have more Dog Talk podcasts as long as Akeem continues to wear fantastic purple sweatsuits. We're all going to be all right. All right? Yes, sounds like a plan. All right. Bye, Akeem. Thanks for for taking the time. And, again, go to IndyStar.com for all your Butler basketball news.